I've got a nice kind of tricky calculus type problem to show you guys today. And what's nice about it is it involves the intermediate value theorem, which is a theorem that you learn in a first semester calculus class. But then we'll have to show that a certain function is continuous. And for fun, we'll show that using the epsilon delta definition of continuity. Okay, so let's look at the statement. We want to show that there is a t, which is between 0 and 1, not including 0 and not including 1, such that the integral from 0 to 1 of x to the t, e to the t, dx equals 3 over 2. Notice 3 over 2 is 1 and a half, so that's actually going to be kind of a hint here. Um, another thing that I want to point out is that if t is not a positive integer, then it's very, very difficult or most of the time impossible to find a closed form for this type of integral because then you get a non-elementary function. So that means that we're not going to be able to find the exact value of t. We'll just show that it exists. But you know, that's also built into the statement of this problem anyway. So like I said, we're going to use the intermediate value theorem, which says if f is continuous on a closed interval a, b, and we have a number y naught, which is between f of a and f of b. I've written it as f of a is less than y naught, which is less than f of b, but you could switch that if you needed to. Then there exists another number, which I'll call x naught, on the open interval a, b, such that f of x naught equals y naught. So looking at this intermediate value theorem, that really gives us a good hint of where to start here. We should probably define some sort of function, and I'm going to call that function g of t to be the integral from 0 to 1 of x to the t, e to the x, dx. So notice, after taking the integral here, that's no longer a function of x. t is the only variable. Now let's just play a best case scenario type thing. So if g is continuous, we can use the intermediate value theorem. But that's a big if because we haven't shown that it's continuous yet. But let's say that we could show that and we'll do that at the end of the video. So let's calculate g evaluated at 0. Notice that is the integral from 0 to 1 of e to the x dx, which is e to the x evaluated from 0 to 1, which is e minus 1. But recall that e is like 2.718, so subtracting 1, we get 1.718. Notice that is bigger than 1.5, which is 3 over 2. Now let's also calculate g evaluated at 1. That'll be the integral from 0 to 1 of x times e to the x dx. Now here we probably want to use integration by parts or maybe the di method or tabular integration. You know, as black pin, red pin calls it the di method, I guess. So we'll have x here, e to the x here. We'll take derivatives down this column, integrals down that column. So that'll leave this with 1, 0, e to the x, e to the x. And then we'll match it up like this on the diagonal, giving this a plus and this a minus. So that quickly gives us our antiderivative. So this is x, e to the x minus e to the x. We need to evaluate that from 0 to 1. Let's notice that if we evaluate this at 1, we'll get e to the 1 minus e to the 1, but that's just 0, so that cancels everything out. And then if we evaluate this at 0, we'll get 0 minus 1. So all in all, we'll get a 1 here. Okay, but now let's see what that says. So note, we have three halves is strictly between g of 0 and g of 1. So that tells us if g is continuous on the interval 0, 1, then such a t exists. So that means that the only thing that's left for us to do is show that g is continuous. So let's maybe clean up the board and we'll do just that. To reiterate what we did on the last board, we defined g of t to be the function defined by the integral from 0 to 1 of x to the t e to the x dx. 
Then we showed that three halves, which was kind of our goal number over here, lied strictly between G evaluated at zero and G evaluated at one. So next we want to show that G is continuous on the interval zero to one, but let's recall the epsilon delta definition of continuity. G is continuous at A if for all epsilon bigger than zero, there exists a delta bigger than zero, such that if T minus A is less than delta, those are in absolute values, then the absolute value of G of T minus G of A is less than epsilon. So generally when you're writing one of these proofs, you want to do some scratch work where you work this in reverse. And that's exactly what we'll do. So I'll just call it scratch work right here. And maybe we'll calculate it in yellow so it doesn't look like our real solution. So like I said, our goal is to take A from the set 0, 1, and then look at G of T minus G of A in absolute values and make that less than epsilon. So we want to construct some delta way down here so that will make this true. But just putting in the definition of G here, we see that that means that the integral from 0 to 1 of x to the t minus x to the a times e to the x dx must be less than epsilon, where all of that's in absolute values. But now we can replace e to the x with just e, given that it's an increasing function on the interval 0 to 1, so we might as well replace it with its maximum. So that will tell us that we have e times the absolute value from 0 to 1 of x to the t minus x to the a dx less than epsilon. So now that's kind of our new goal. Now we can take the antiderivative and plug 1 and 0 in. Notice that that will give us 1 over t plus 1 minus 1 over a plus 1. Those are still in absolute values. We have e multiplied outside and we have epsilon on the other side of the equation. Next, we'd probably like to find a common denominator and add these. So that'll leave us with an e on this side of the equation. A common denominator will be t plus a times a plus 1. And then we'll have a plus 1 minus t plus 1, so that will be a minus t. And then we've got that this is less than epsilon. But now what I want to notice is that we can replace this denominator with just the number 1, and we have created something larger. This is less than the absolute value of a minus t, which is equal to the absolute value of t minus a. So if we can make all of that less than epsilon, well, I need an e here, then we're good to go. So what does that mean our delta will be? Well, solving for this absolute value of t minus a, our delta will be epsilon over e. Okay, so now let's get to the careful proof that this is a continuous function. So maybe I'll write that as a claim. G is continuous on the interval 0, 1. So let's say that we are given some arbitrary a on the interval 0, 1 and some epsilon bigger than 0, we can set delta equal to epsilon over e. And now we essentially do this calculation which was scratch work and reverse. So let's notice if the absolute value of t minus a is less than delta, well, that's the same thing as saying that the absolute value of t minus a is less than epsilon over e. But then that's the same thing as saying e times the absolute value of t minus a is less than epsilon. But then by this entire calculation right here, we see that the absolute value of g of t minus g of a is less than or equal to e times the absolute value of t minus a, which is less than epsilon, where this box is filled with something which is mimicking this calculation over here. Okay, so in the end, we have that g is continuous on 0, 1, 
That combined with the fact that g of zero is less than three halves and g of one is greater than three halves allows us to apply the intermediate value theorem and bring into existence this special value of t where g of t equals three halves. And that's a good place to stop.